Welcome to The Picklist, the podcast for curious food industry minds. I'm Julia Glotz, a writer, editor, and consultant specializing in food and drink. Every week, I'm joined by an expert guest to discuss the news, trends, and developments shaping food and grocery retail right now. You'll get a personal perspective on how business leaders and leading thinkers from different parts of our industry are making sense of the big issues. My guests will also share what's on their personal reading list, bringing you a curated selection of thought-provoking articles from the trade press, national media, and other titles. You can find links to all the articles and suggestions for further reading in the episode show notes and also on thepicklist.co.uk. Now let's start the show. Hello and welcome to episode 49 of The Picklist. I hope you're having a good week. As I'm recording this, COP26 is just a few days away, so I was thrilled to welcome an expert in sustainable food and farming on the podcast this week to discuss what's on the agenda in Glasgow and what we should be listening out for in terms of announcements that might be coming out over the coming weeks from a food and farming perspective, but also to just take the opportunity to talk about sustainability and sustainable food more generally. So my guest this week is Caroline Drummond, MBE, Chief Executive of LEAF, the sustainable farming organisation that's behind the LEAF mark and also initiatives like Open Farm Sunday. Caroline has been leading LEAF for 30 years, so she has a wealth of experience and expertise to share when it comes to sustainable farming and sustainable food supply chains. She's also passionate about connecting the public more with food production and food producers, And she has some really interesting observations to share about how LEAF does that, but also what kinds of questions people ask farmers when they do actually get the chance to meet them. Some of them quite surprising. Anyway, that's coming up in a moment. But first, let me bring you up to speed on some of the big stories in feed and grocery retail this week. It was budget week this week with Chancellor Rishi Sunak unveiling his autumn budget. Keen announcements from a food and drink perspective included a shake-up of the UK's approach to alcohol duty. The system is being streamlined, with the number of duty rates being cut from 15 down to 6, and drinks are now being taxed based on how strong they are. The Chancellor also announced new measures to support craft producers, and said he was getting rid of the 28% premium duty on sparkling wine. The row between the UK and France over post-Brexit fishing rights stepped up another gear this week after the French government warned that unless it receives further licences for its vessels, it would ban British boats from landing seafood at key ports and impose more checks. Number 10 described the threats as disappointing and disproportionate and said it would retaliate if necessary. Sainsbury's CEO Simon Roberts has written to customers to assure them that there will be plenty of food available this Christmas, despite the ongoing disruption to supply chains. Roberts wrote, We are confident that even if the exact product you are looking for isn't available, there will be a good alternative. He also pointed out that frozen turkeys were already available to buy in store. Staying with Sainsbury's, the retailer this week announced it was bringing forward its net zero target by five years. It now plans to reach net zero emissions across its own operations by 2035, having previously committed to 2040. Sainsbury's, of course, is a partner to the COP26 conference that kicks off in Glasgow this week. In other COP26 news, Co-op is temporarily rebranding six of its stores as Co-op26 to raise awareness of the COP26 climate conference and engage customers on sustainability. Tesco announced a pilot partnership with Gorillas, the rapid delivery app. As part of the partnership, Gorillas will set up micro-fulfillment sites at five large Tesco stores, from which it will deliver groceries to Tesco customers in just 10 minutes. Morrison stopped trading on the stock exchange this week after 54 years as a public company following its takeover by private equity firm Clayton de Billier and Rice. And Waitrose published its annual food and drink report, highlighting trends such as the return of the dinner party, the rise of potato-based milk alternatives, as well as climatarian eating. I'll be talking to Caroline about the report and some of its findings in more detail later on in the show. 
Bindback 2030, the organisation that campaigns to make the food system fairer for young people, has published a report criticising the food industry for encouraging teenagers to overeat by making confusing or misleading packaging claims about health and nutrition. For example, HFSS products that also carry positive on-pack claims about things like fibre content make it difficult for young people to identify products that are genuinely healthy, the group said. And finally, recipe box service Gusto is trialling what it describes as the world's first edible stock cube wrapper. The wrapper is made from pea protein and dissolves without affecting taste or performance, and it will replace Gusto's existing stock mix sachet. If it ends up being rolled out in full, the wrapper could help Gusto save up to 17 tonnes of plastic a year. These are some of the big headlines this week. You can find links to all the stories I mentioned in the show notes and also on thepicklist.co.uk. And now, here's my conversation with Caroline Drummond. Caroline, welcome to The Picklist. Thank you for being my guest. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me. Now, you are Chief Executive of LEAF, the Sustainable Farming Organisation and Assurance Scheme, and LEAF stands for Linking Environment and Farming. I know most of my listeners from the world of FMCG will know LEAF very well, but not everyone is going to be perhaps 100% up to speed on what LEAF is, how it works, what it stands for. Can you give us a super quick primer on what LEAF is all about? Certainly. Uh, We've been going now 30 years. I've been very honoured to be running the organisation since we started, and it is very much about what we say. You know, it is linking environment and farming, and it is supporting Farmers to be more sustainable uh, through really good farming practices, best of modern, best of traditional, uh, an opportunity for consumers to get engaged through their purchasing power, and of course, the marketplace driving change. And boy, we couldn't be in a better place now with all the challenges that we're facing, but the solution opportunities are right at the forefront. And we're going to, I think, go on to talk about some of the opportunities around those solutions a little bit later, because you've brought some really interesting articles for us to talk about. But tell us a bit about your personal background first. So you said you've been involved with LEAF for 30 years. How did that happen? And how did you become involved or interested in food farming and sustainability more generally? So I'm I'm not from a farming background originally. My father was a diver, a naval diver. So my childhood was kind of in, on or under the water. Um, but of course, uh, you know, that gave me a huge respect for the sea and for nature. And uh, where we lived and where I was brought up down in Hampshire, uh, you know, from the age of about 14, uh, I was picking vegetables um, at local farms and things like that. And then when I left school, I went to agricultural college, working for a year before then uh, on a dairy farm. And and that was really sensible because it gives you an insight. And then I had to work another nine months and I drove tractors. And then from there, uh, I had I did some research and I I went to Barbados. Obviously, it was a hard job and somebody's got to do it Um, (laughs) doing sugarcane research, which was fantastic. And then when I left uh, Sealhane with a degree in agriculture, I travelled for a year uh, with a friend of mine going and experiencing a lot of farming across the globe and obviously especially Australia and New Zealand. Before then, um, kind of pursuing career, I started in a management trainee and then I lectured for three years in crops and soil and machinery. Um, and I was a CT- CITB forklift truck driver instructor as well. And the job for LEAF came up. It was a three year project. They were looking for somebody to kind of actually the job description was reposition agriculture in the minds of the general public. So this was back in in 1991. Wow. And uh, so, yes, uh, and I sort of said, well, you know, you can't just do that. You've got to ensure that you've got good farming practices. And they said, yes, this integrated farm management approach is exactly what we're about. And and I guess that was, yes, that's been my, my inroad to um, driving uh, an organisation with, boy, wonderful staff, wonderful farmers and wonderful members. So... Very lucky. 
Fantastic. And I think listeners may have seen quite a few headlines around LEAF recently because Tesco made a big announcement that will it will implement LEAF's assurance scheme across its global supply chain. And I've seen you que- quoted all across the trade press saying this is a transformative moment in LEAF's history. Could you talk a little bit about what this partnership with Tesco involves and how you think it will transform LEAF? Yes, so we originated LeafMark back in the sort of the late nineties, uh, and many of the supermarkets, a lot who are no longer around, were very involved in that. But actually, Waitrose were very much at the forefront, and all their fresh produce is and you know is still now LeafMark certified. And in addition to that, we work very closely with Marks and Spencers uh, and the Farming with Nature work that they're doing. In fact, we work with all the retailers. But I think what's been interesting is Tesco have set a big ambition around halving the footprint of their basket or their consumer's basket. And from that point of view, that has provided an opportunity to really understand better, you know, what's going to help farmers deliver that. And they, you know, they did a lot of due diligence and recognise that not only is Leaf Mark uh, robust, we're ICL fully code compliant. So that means that we adopt really rigorous standards. We have independent external verification and we have beyond certification. So we really try and get people to buy into all of this. So I think the time has very much been right for them. And for us, we set out our ambition in November last year to scale up and accelerate our capability were, you know, we've we've got the great foundation for the many farmers that we've been working with uh, over the years. And now it's the time to fly. So that's the real opportunity. I was so interested in seeing that announcement, though, because it feels like in the last few years, we have seen retailers, but also some big brand owners, obviously becoming more aware that there is a a consumer demand for more sustainable choices, but therefore also an opportunity to differentiate through whatever you're doing with sustainability. And it has, in some cases, led retailers and, and brand owners to really try and differentiate through whatever certification or assurance scheme they're going for and possibly define some of their own proprietary schemes as opposed to just going with with something um, that's sort of available more more generally. From what you're seeing in the market, do you still see that drive for differentiation, which always worries farmers because it can lead to duplication of uh, on auditing? Or are you seeing that pendulum swing back a little bit more towards something more consistent? I, I'm actually seeing that pendulum swing back, but swing back to drive forwards. So uh, I was at a meeting today with um, some Vietnamese farmers and the UNDP. And actually, instead of saying build back better, they say build forwards better. And actually, I think it's trying, you know, I think we're in a spot now of we seriously need to do action on the ground. Um, My favourite saying is, when all's said and done, there's a lot more said than done. And the reality is, we need to do. And so I think this is where, you know, retailers are in such a powerful place in terms of communication with consumers, their responsibility of supplying affordable food, quality food, and of course, supporting farmers in, in delivering good environmental practices. So I think, actually, you know, sustainability is not a competition. It is we've got to deliver. We've got nine years in which we have to ensure that we have not increased the temperature of the globe by over one and a half degrees centigrade. And in addition to that, we've got to deliver against the 17 sustainable development goals. So we've really got to, we can't wait, we've got to put things in place. And and I think they've recognised actually this opportunity to accelerate leaf mark across not only UK growers, but on a global level is going to be really important. And you've already talked about being on a call with uh, with Vietnam a little bit earlier. And um, it made me wonder, actually, one of the challenges during COVID, of course, was that in terms of auditing global supply chains, usually you would be traveling around the world, there'd be on-site visits, auditors kind of on the ground inspecting sites and, and farmers. And of course, that became impossible pretty much during COVID. Where are we now in terms of what is possible 
Um, are we back to on-site visits and inspections or are we still doing things remotely or is it a mixture? <laughs> that wonderful word, hybrid. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, so yes, we responded pretty rapidly with remote auditing and actually there were some very good learnings from that. And so going forwards, without a doubt, they will need, you know, we will adopt a hybrid approach. But I think what's really exciting, um, when I started with LEAF, we did some self-assessment documentation, what was originally called the LEAF audit, that's now called the LEAF Sustainable Farming Review. It was a carbon copy document that farmers used to complete, and they'd return the paper document to us. Then it became little floppy disks then CD-ROMs, and from now it's, you know, interactive online. And our capability to understand remote sensing, remote collection of data, uh, understand the sort of the hotspots of where there are challenges, and in addition to that, celebrate the good places where there's some amazing work going on is really, really key. And, and I think going forwards, we're, we're going to be much cuter and smarter in really trying to drive and understand, um, you know, <laughs> what's good. At the end of the day, we're not trying to catch people out. Of course, there will be some people that won't be able to make the standard, but we are trying to support people to be more sustainable so their businesses are more resilient, so that ultimately we've got better, healthier soil, cleaner quality air, right through to enhanced biodiversity and, of course, quality water. And so it's it's really in our interest to support farmers in any way that we can. I remember a few few months ago, I had a conversation with a fresh produce business about auditing and, and inspections and, and how they had sort of coped with uh, managing this during COVID. And they were saying that actually there are certain things that they found they were able to do better using mm. remote technology and Actually, they've, they've moved to, to a hybrid system, as you say now, where they are giving the inspector on the ground much more time to really focus on the stuff that can only be done when you're there in person and use the technology uh, where appropriate to, to support that. Have you found that as well, that actually there are certain aspects of auditing that are much better handled remotely? Oh, ex exactly that. Yes, without a doubt. Brilliant. Now we're having this conversation just a few days before COP26 and I can't have an expert on sustainability and sustainable food and farming on the show without quizzing her on COP26. One of the things that's so challenging, isn't it, is that there's this avalanche of news already um, around COP26 and I think it's sometimes quite difficult to sort of sift through that and really make sense of what is important? What is relevant to me? What do I need to be paying attention to? Mm. As someone who knows this area very well, who knows the issues very well, what are you listening out for, watching out for from a food and farming perspective around COP26? So the real opportunity, I think, for farmers is going to be in, well, you know, we need to stop digging out fossil fuels out of the ground. So it's the innovation and the development in, in terms of really trying to drive change um, for supporting farmers in new approaches to whether we have hydrogen um, tractors, whether we have electric tractors, whether we have alternatives to concrete and areas like that. So, you know, for us, it's going to be really important in terms of that whole energy piece. It's about attention to detail at the end of the day, and that will also be driven by um, how fertilizer is developed. The other area uh, is nature-based solutions. And um, sorry, I'm a real one for sayings, but uh, another saying is, you know, forget nature, she'll go away. And we have discovered that, that if you do not work with, look after and nurture nature, then yes, we lose the biodiversity that's so important for us. And so nature-based solutions are really critical because actually, you know, nature is so adaptable, so smart and so capable of actually trying to um, well combat against climate change and the changes that we're really seeing now. So for us to be able to work through that is going to be very key. We're working with the IUCN and indeed the Bond Challenge to really try and, and drive practical solutions on the ground with farmers. We've got some great projects on the go at the moment. 
Um, and the farmers, they, you know, they know their challenges, they adapt things, they experiment, and they come up with solutions. Not all of them work, but actually they then have a conversation with somebody else and adapt it again, and maybe it does work. And I think, you know, some of the things like nature-inspired um, and, and also technology-based solutions, our capability to drive those those all together is going to be really important. So I'll be listening out definitely for the nature-based solutions and see where that that really sort of fits in with agriculture. I think farming is quite quiet in this year's COP, if I'm brutally honest. Mm. Um, and I think maybe next year, I believe it's going to be in Africa, potentially in Ethiopia, and actually farming and food may be much more sort of center stage in some of the discussions, because I think we're looking at quite an industrial approach to COP at the moment, if I'm brutally honest. Um, but it'll be fun. It'll be my first COP. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, we're there for, for three days. We're working with Sainsbury's on um, global farmers and really engaging young people in schools with farmers right across the globe, uh, which fits in very well with some work that we do called Farmer Time, where we work with um, the villa with village farm and, and Tom and Lisa Martin and ourselves in really engaging schools and 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 farmers together, uh, so there'll be a bit of that. And I think the other thing that we mustn't forget, we have just had COP fifteen, which was the biological diversity COP, and of course we've had the UNFSS. Mm -hmm. uh, or it sounds like the great ship UNFSS, um, but the United Nations Food Systems Summit. And all of these, you know, the, I guess somewhere there is an amazing puppeteer who is masterminding the opportunity to draw these together, because ultimately that's what we've got to do. You know, COP is focusing on, on climate change. It's about trees, yes, but it's not just about planting trees, it's managing trees. It's about ensuring that we get smarter with energy. Cars is in there. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how action, you know, well, we need to commit further to the Paris Accord and, and see what the next lot of action is as well. Now I'm going to bring you on to your articles because you picked mm. some really interesting choices. So I can already tell uh, you've got good housekeeping in there. You've got the Royal Society of Arts. You're clearly someone who enjoys reading widely. Tell us a bit about your reading habits. Which publications do you read regularly? And how do you keep up to speed with what's happening in the food and farming sector? So I guess um, my, my most regular, and I didn't pick a pick up an article from there is of course the, the farmers weekly sorry <laughs> um, I, I'm married to a dairy farmer so uh, farming is is something that's very inherent between in my life uh, and of course you know on the loo floor uh, there lies all the farming publications around dairy and, and the general ones um, we do take the times and uh, that online version and it's brilliant and I think the BBC news is also actually really informative for some top level stuff. I think what always worries me is many of the news stories never get followed on. So, you know, you hear about unbelievable flooding in Germany and 600 people, Germans missing. I don't know what happened to them. Were they, are they okay? And I think uh, for me, it's trying to find the stories that then actually sort of bring us to the next stage so that you can either feel, Phew, thank goodness they all survived or golly, you know, this is another indication of some serious things that are going on. And we also, you know, we, we take the week and private eye, which actually also are really just good for articles, I think more than anything, but the three, yeah. And I, I take uh, good housekeeping because I'm, I, I just think it's really interesting to find out about some of the discussions. It's a pretty, you know, some of the articles are quite in depth. Some are very superficial, if I'm honest. But it does uh, bring to light some of the thinking of, of women. Um, and in addition to that, yes, I'm, I'm a fellow of the RSA. Um, and so I get their journal. And uh, my daughter is is studying biochemistry at Bath University. And so she gets uh, <laughs> she has the biochemist 
and uh, uh, I try and keep up with her, which is <laughs> a bit of a challenge sometimes. I, I can imagine, but I, I love that as a, as a spread of publications. And you've certainly pushed me out of my comfort zone a little bit because those aren't, I don't think any of those publications that you picked would have been on my normal reading list. And I always love that when, when uh, guests bring completely different publications uh, to the show that I wouldn't have looked at uh, normally. So I'm going to start with the RSA journal. Um, and you picked a piece here with the headline, A Local Focus. It's written by Hannah Webster, who is the RSA's joint head of programme, People and Places. And she is explaining that the RSA is currently doing a lot of exploration around the concept of collective well-being and how the RSA itself might have to evolve to support people in leading a good life. And it's a really, it's quite a long article and mm -hmm. very in-depth, but two of the key themes that, that really stood out to me here is the article looks at this uh, concept of personal responsibility for leading a good life versus a more systemic support. How much are we expecting people to make good choices just because and how much are we supporting them uh, in, in a slightly more organized and joined up way? And then, of course, as the headline suggests, really looking at opportunities for more local solutions. And Hannah Webster makes the point in the article that particularly in the wake of the pandemic, when we saw fantastic local initiatives spring up, there is an opportunity here to think more locally, get people, get citizens more actively involved in shaping local services and defining what those services should offer to local people. What stood out to you from that article? What, what made you pick this? Well, I picked it because I'm fascinated of trying to really understand what well-being means. So is it mental well-being? Is it physical well-being? Is it happiness? And how is it something uh, that should be my responsibility? And, and this was actually part of her article is that exactly as you've said you know that collective responsibility of trying to support people in being well ultimately I guess and I and I think um you know I I, I can remember uh things like there is a there's a happiness profile as well you know I think Finland is the happiest country in the world we're about number 17 and I just thought wow you know the very fact that it's local I question local because uh, local is your community. And if I think of, you know, what's my community? And yes, you know, I wouldn't want you to think I don't have any friends. But, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of my community is, is farming and it's not necessarily local. Uh, and I think it's just kind of, it was trying to pin out uh, and to see, work out actually what was what was community and what is local and what will work i think the rsa are always great at trying to work out how to solve problems and i think they've really um identified that that whole area of actually is covid a turning point now for helping support people in a local community and and work more collectively and there's a lot of people that are still uncomfortable almost with the term wellness and well-being and um it's it's sort of it's how do we make it more acceptable and I think a younger generation you know it's it's part of their parlance um and uh, that's something that's really quite interesting but I yeah I I I thought it was great um and I there was something else that was particularly sort of stood out for me was you know our ambition is for local food systems to be designed to actively support individual and collective well-being I mean that is as you've said in the introduction you know that is so important that we aspire to be well and we have the support to make us well and I think there's some really important touch points which they don't actually touch in here is that when you are not well, actually that is the opportunity to reach out to people more and help support them either in their physical, their, their obviously their health and, and indeed their mental well-being as well. Reading the article, it also raised a question for me around co 
connectedness to the food system and to what extent having some kind of connection with where your food comes from, how it's produced, all of that feeds into a sense of well-being around nourishing yourself and and generally food. And it particularly uh, made me wonder about Open Farm Sunday, which is an initiative that, that LEAF runs and, and has been running for, for, for quite some time, um, where you are looking to connect the public with food producers, with farmers here in the country and give them an opportunity to come onto farm, have a look around, ask some questions. Um, I, I think the most recent one you've done virtually, haven't you? Um, just at the, the end of September. But can you just talk a little bit about the importance of having the public feel connected to, to where the food comes from? So it's not just something that appears as if by magic on a shelf or via a delivery service, as, as is increasingly the case. And what kinds of questions do you find the public typically asks your farmers who are participating in Open Farm Sunday? So the the great thing, we've been carrying it out now for 16 years and uh, about a quarter of a million on a normal year will go out on Open Farm Sunday. And the advantage that we have as a farming community is that farming touches all five senses. And the more senses that you can touch, the deeper the learning and appreciation of people. And so Um, you know, the comments are, you make farming come alive. I never realized it was such skills. I love it. Now I'm going to wave at the farmer in the tractor rather than, you know, say, please get off the road. Um, And so I think it's, it is absolutely critical. The questions uh, are amazing. Um, I think because we are 88% urban now in the UK, Uh, For many people, they are not given the opportunity to really discover the story underneath, you know, behind their food. And so from that point of view, you can see the parents learning through their children and the children are asking wonderful questions. And, you know, we we might do something like friend or foe about um, different aphids, you know, ladybird friend, aphid, boo, you know, foe (laughs) uh, and that sort of thing. So but there are questions about, you know. Um, well, I, I think it's wrong to to milk cows because you have to kill them uh, every time you milk them. And you just think, oh, right. No, that's that's not the case. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and and it's it's fine because ultimately it's people wanting to know. Mm-hmm. And so that's really critical. And it's uh, we've been working in the past on doing citizen um, citizen surveys as well. And all of that just it sparks people's interest, imagination. Uh, they then start looking at things like robots in the field, the precision of application of whether it's using pesticides or biological control methods, right through to the importance of poo and things like that. There's lots of questions about poo always, um, <laughs> but, you know, and how important that is. But I, the other thing I, I think which you've alluded to is that element of culture. And I, I think, you know, sometimes we, we, we've almost got to the story of sustainability being so so important that we've kind of lost the element of it's also fun and food is fun you know you can play with your food your feeling and you appreciate and then you're sharing and you share with friends or you share different cultures and different understanding and I think that whole element of what agriculture is about and the whole food culture is about uh, linking of course to rural areas as well is something that's really important. Yeah, I'm so interested in what you were saying, though, about um, some of the questions that you get um, during Open Farm Sunday, or, or the questions that your farmers, your participating farmers get. You hear so much about this need to connect people more to, to food and farming. And Open Farm Sunday is one Sunday a year. Are you getting is there lots of interest in actually doing this more frequently to give people a more regular opportunity to connect with farmers in this way? So um, a- along with doing online inspection for and auditing, um, the other thing is we, we did do online Open Farm Sunday, um, and that's good. I think the reality, there's a lot of entertainment for people, and actually the focus of a day provides a real opportunity to kind of, you know, do that sort of razzmatazz and go out on farm but uh we merged with a 
an, another charity some six years ago uh, to form Leaf Education. And so we work with teachers and farmers to really ensure that the curriculum has got agriculture sort of ingrained mm. within it. So whether it's French or English or physics or biology, actually there are some wonderful examples within agriculture as brilliant case studies to support teachers. You know, teachers are highly professional, really short of time, and they need any resources that they have needs to be very curriculum ready. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we work not only with our regional education consultants, but we work with other charities uh, through Countryside Classroom, where all the key stages are mapped against different um, subjects and then with different resources. And it's it's just brilliant. Um, we work with both primary school children and and that's great. It's fun. They're adventurous. And also, though, with um uh, with young people and um, doing their GCSEs and mm. A-levels. And it's just been quite fantastic. We we run a competition. In fact, it was held last weekend at Clavassi College in Wales. And you've got people who have never experienced being out on farm, never driven a tractor, never obviously milked a cow. And then they are just, each time you sort of unpick that wow factor of whether it's understanding what you're doing in a tractor, what you're moving, what you're cleaning, or whether it's understanding the, the sheer sort of capacity of a cows are large, you know, <laughs> uh, and and their yields, uh, it's it drives inspiration and it drives that sort of that buzz factor. Now I'm going to move you on to your second article. And the second one I'd love to talk to you about is from Good Housekeeping. You already mentioned earlier, you like to keep an eye on Good Housekeeping because it's always interesting to see how some food and farming related issues are framed for a wider consumer audience as well. This particular article has a headline uh, that says, Mind What You Eat. And it's about ultra processed foods and their role in obesity and other health problems. And so there's a general, I'd say, sort of discussion around what are they, uh, what are what's some of the scientific evidence that's emerging around ultra processed foods, links to obesity, etc., increased risk of cancer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, what I thought was actually quite interesting about this article was some of the practical advice that was given to consumers in terms of just understanding the difference between what is unprocessed versus minimally processed versus processed versus ultra processed. And then what should you look out for on labels if you're concerned about the degree of processing? In a nutshell here, the advice was uh, look out for the length of the ingredient list and any ingredients that uh, you can't pronounce or that you wouldn't recognize as something you might have in your own kitchen. And then also just some guidance around uh, how you can increase the amount of unprocessed foods that you have in your diet. So very sort of, I think, interesting consumer focused take on a debate that sort of, I mean, I remember ultra processed food was sort of quite a niche topic, you know, out of that Brazilian study a, a few years ago to now something that is being discussed within a good housekeeping, I think is, is quite remarkable. What did you take from that article? Well, I, I think it was the very fact that they did kind of raise the the whole debate around ultra processed foods and and being very clear about you know salt sugars fats make sure you know it's it's in balance where you're eating processed foods because people do eat processed foods because they're quick and easy but the reality is actually it goes back to some advice from Michael Pollan uh, and he wrote this book, I think, you know, eat food, mm -hmm. I eat food that looks like food, not too much, and mainly vegetables. And that's not saying, you know, don't eat milk, uh, meat and milk. Uh, but I think that whole area, I mean, I thought it was quite interesting they put in about labels, because actually, if we really want to ensure that we're eating better, we should be eating food that hasn't got any labels on it in the first place. So it is the fresh fruit and vegetables or it is the meat that you would have got from the butchers because you know the authenticity and you know uh, the bioavailability. But I thought it was actually very well explained uh, and I, I thought it was it was clear. Um, 
uh, I thought it was some some of it was a little bit complex about sort of the the processed and the ultra processed bits, um, but ultimately it was it was nicely set out as an article, um, and so it was yes it was good and the sort of things you really should be eating. It was interesting. I was surprised they didn't reference the healthy eating plate. And I was, well, I, and maybe they did, but I couldn't find it. Um, and they also didn't reference the Henry Dimbleby National Food Strategy. Um, but then maybe that was because it's that sort of that next question that you kind of want to ask, really. Um, but it, it I, I liked it. I thought it was good. I'm always quite conflicted when it comes to the debate about processed foods I find and and I know we're talking about ultra processed as a sort of particular subset of of, of processing because I do have a degree of sympathy for for some of the sort of feed industry argument and concerns that are raised around just making people scared of the word processing in a sort of quite Mm. undefined oh god you know the evils of chemistry and processes you don't understand and I think going back to um the point you raised around the first article of sort of well-being and, and a sense of wellness around feed, I sometimes worry that uh, making people feel very worried about their food and very scared about uh, the, the sort of terrible processes that might have gone on to create their feed actually stops them from having that enjoyment and gets in the way and adds a degree of guilt and worry uh, in into feed choices um, that... I'm not sure it's always that helpful or, or, or that productive. What do you make of that? How do you think we can strike the right balance? And obviously telling people about the benefits of eating unprocessed fruit and veg and, 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 and opting for healthier choices without making them feel terrible every time they opt for something more convenient, which as we know, we all do and we all enjoy from time to time as well. Yes, and, and I, I think, yes, I mean, you kind of allude to that whole area of guilt. Yeah. And, you know, I, I eat a biscuit or a donut, I'm guilty, you know. And so I think that is, and that's the complexity of that sort of message is certainly lost in this because it was just focusing on ultra processed, and there wasn't an article before and the following article was identifying the signs of cancer. So... Uh, you kind of think oh gosh you know Uh, so from that point of view I guess um, this is where I feel there is such an important job to be made around education around the collective area of helping and supporting people to make changes in their diet because exactly as you've said people will buy processed foods because it's convenient or because their child will eat it. You know, if you are a, you know, so many houses in Birmingham or in big cities actually don't even have a kitchen, you know, so you have a microwave there and you can't suddenly cook some grand cuisine from Ottolenghi or something like that. So it's really, you know, it it does serve a really important piece. You know, you've got a 15 year old son who's come back from rugby. He's eaten a banana. He's eaten a Mars bar. And he's still hungry, you know, and um, that whole area is actually, yes, we guilt is not a good way to drive change without a doubt. Um, but I think we do need to understand how we can support change. And that's. You know, I, I, I find the debate now of kind of body beautiful, uh, the protein debate right through to uh, the vegan versus meat debate is, again, it becomes really complex because at the end of the day, food is something that's, you know, it is in the Maslow hierarchy of needs, something that we need and we need quality. Now, the third article I'm really keen to talk to you about actually is one I picked this time. So this is the latest Waitrose Food and Drink Report, which is out this week. I always uh, keep a very close eye on that Waitrose Food and Drink Report. I think it's incredibly well done. Always super interesting. There's uh, some really interesting trends, plenty of weird and wonderful stuff in there as well. The top TikTok food trends and there's potato milk, which is going to be the next uh, next big thing and implant-based milk alternatives. 
But also this year, they really have done quite a lot around sustainability and consumers becoming more focused on sustainable choices, which is why I was so keen to talk to you about this. And there are quite a few different data points. They always run a big consumer survey, not just with Waitrose shoppers, but with a representative sample of uh, of, uh, consumers from around the country. Um, But just a few things that I thought really stood out to me. So three quarters of the consumers they surveyed said that they had tried harder not to waste food this year. And 56% are saying this is something they intend to carry on. Quite interesting to see how that marries up with some of the recent rap figures that suggest, you know, there's possibly a bit of a gap between intention and action, uh, certainly in an area like, like food waste. But I think certainly interesting to see such a high proportion of consumers say that food waste reduction is a is a big priority. Packaging concerns, you won't be surprised to hear, particularly around plastic, remain really, really uh, a high priority. 71% say they have tried to reduce the amount of packaging they take home. But in terms of future trends, some really interesting stuff here that they've pulled out. So Waitrose predicts the rise of the climatarian, which is a a new term they have coined, I think, in the vein of the of the flexitarian. But um, what the climatarian does is uh, it's someone who decides what to eat largely based on the environmental impact of their food and drink. And to support that, they, uh, in their consumer research, ask consumers how important the carbon footprint of their food and drink was to, to them. And 70% broadly said that the carbon footprint was important to them. Um, so I was really keen to get your take on some of the trends that, that they've highlighted. They also talk about a new 5-2 style diet where they, being Waitrose, are seeing evidence at least that uh, as consumers look to reduce their meat consumption, they're moving closer to a 5 2 split, so five days during the week of not eating meat, and then two days at the weekend do uh, where they then do eat meat. What did you make of, of, of some of those trends, and particularly some of the consumer research around attitudes? Well, I, I thought it was fascinating, and, and hats off to Waitrose, because They do have very strong values in their partnership approach with all their their partners and all the people that work for them and, of course, their their customers. And so I also liked the climatarian ism um <laughs> and it's a mouthful uh, yeah it is a bit of a mouthful and i thought it was really interesting because you kind of feel you need an app for that um and you know i guess i'm slightly experimental when it comes to cooking and what we eat here and so i've had a sort of a dna test to see what sort of appropriate diets etc and i I I know waitresses have done quite a lot of work also on on trying to get consumers to have apps so that they get what's right for them. Uh, I don't know how far they've got, but you kind of see this starting to come through. So you get that reassurance, that little QR code uh, maybe on the on the side of what you're purchasing, Mm. uh, which ultimately would be, you know, this is this is good for biodiversity, it's good for carbon, it's good for water quality, it's good for soil. Um, and, and that would be really fun. I, I, I loved that. Um, I think it's interesting. Carbon is, a, is very much a single thing, though. I mean, we mm-hmm. are, 18% of us is carbon. So are you saying, you know, what's, what is net, what does it really look like? Um, ultimately, it's what farmers can do to sort of, basically keep carbon in the ground as, through good soil management, through trees, through plants. And I, I know that there used to be carbon labelling and on crisps, actually. And I can remember, you know, pretty confusing where you have, you know, this embedded carbon in this 35 gram packet of crisps is 65 grams. So what does that mean? And I think the complexity of carbon is is really difficult and it's trying to account where does it start and where does it end and where's the responsibility but I I love the climate bit around that. Um, I think the other area that really um, was the rewilding one. Mm. Uh, Leckford Estate is one of our leaf demonstration farmers 
and we'll we'll be meeting with them very soon because they're they're going to become one of our uh, regenerative beacons of excellence farms as well. And I think you know this again, this whole area of of real wilding is it's captured people's imagination, um, but it's sort of for better and worse. So some of it is around, wow, you know, that's going to be great. We're going to see vast tracts of countryside with beavers and wolves and bears and everything like that. But actually, the reality is, you know, we do have land sharing in this country and the importance of food production, the importance of self-sufficiency, as well as food security is something that's really key. Uh, And so it's just working out where does where does rewilding really fit? And I think, you know, that's what's important, that that's something that they're certainly looking at the Leckford Farm Estate. Um, What's, you know, what are those areas that we really need to enhance and accelerate the nature within that area? And where does it fit with our growing of our crops and supporting, obviously, the the leaf mark certified there, there as well. So I thought that was good. Potatoes are pretty cool. And I think um, it's really interesting how actually rather than shipping almond milk and other sort of milk soya etc and and growing our oat milk opportunity as well as potato milk that's great and fine however that said and yes I am married to a dairy farmer (laughs) the reality is that milk is a very important um, food for us you know, the bioavailability of all the nutrients, the rich source of iodine in it, you know, it's really critical to growing bones and particularly in young bones. And when you look at the sustainable development goals, it is some of the measures of malnutrition at the other, the opposite scale from obesity is around stunting in under five year olds. And, you know, one of the challenges we've seen poverty grow with COVID and access to food and good meals, you know, really sort of fall. And that's a real challenge. And so milk is is actually something that's a very rich, uh, inexpensive nutrient to support young bones to ensure that, you know, whilst we're focusing on saying, right, we're going to reduce our carbon footprint in this area, that somewhere we haven't actually started to cause another challenge in that we haven't built up the soil organic matter because of the manures, or we haven't actually recognized the bioavailability of the nutrients within meat and milk that, you know, that satisfy and build up our own bodies. I was also very interested in what you were saying just around the complexity um, of the issues and, and the challenge in getting those across to consumers in a way that gives them enough information to make informed choices, but at the same time doesn't overwhelm them. And I think what you were saying about having QR codes, I think there are many more brands that are actually exploring this, especially in the wake of Test and Trace. We're all a little bit more used to scanning QR codes. And there is obviously an opportunity there for consumers to access more detailed information beyond what you could reasonably squeeze onto a pack where you know there's so much information already jostling for for consumers attention but what have you seen work in terms of helping consumers get their heads head around things like regenerative farming things like soil health that are not that intuitive for many people I think what really helps is just understanding farming it's good common sense farming and whilst there are you know extremes at all levels in of society actually most people are, you know, somewhere in the middle. They want uh, to ensure that they have um, good foods and they want to ensure that they have an opportunity to have a good life, you know, friends, family, etc. And I guess um, what really works is just that sort of practical explanation of not too complex. And I think that's we all do it, you know, within farming, of course, we've got our own language and politicians have their own language right through to journalists, everybody, doctors. And sometimes you think, well, yes, I can use this language to look really smart. But actually, that doesn't really share the information that people need to know. And so it's it's the clarity, the simplicity and honestness. 
So I can remember the very first Open Farm Sunday we had, many of the farmers said, oh, should we not show them our sprayer for mm. pesticides? And I said, well, why? Is it illegal? And they said, no. And, you know, do you use it regularly? And it applies, at, you know, we have really rigorous testing in how we use chemicals on farm and, you know, all the modes of action and, and the advice that is supporting it. And they said, uh, and they said, oh, well, fine. And for the public, they need and wanted to know because they do realise the challenges of pests and diseases and indeed the importance of crop health. They see it in their own gardens or allotments or, you know, little, little boxes uh, in their windows. Honesty, transparency and keep it simple. We're pretty much out of time. I feel like I could have kept you for at least another hour to ask you about um, your your take on, on various issues. But um, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and being my guest. If listeners want to find out more about LEAF, about Open Farm Sunday, about your educational initiatives, or if they want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Best way is to go on our website, www.leafuk.org. Or please, you know, my email address is on there as well. So do, yes, get involved, sign up to our our newsletter as well. Fantastic. Caroline, thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and found it useful. If you did, please consider giving The Pick List a five-star rating on whichever platform you're listening and leave a review. It tells me you're enjoying the show and would like it to continue and it helps me reach more listeners. If you'd like to connect, you can find me on LinkedIn at juliaglotz.com and on thepicklist.co.uk. And if you'd like more thought-provoking reads for your personal reading list, please subscribe to The Trim, my free weekly newsletter at juliaglotz.com forward slash newsletter. See you next time.